Hi, I'm Hannah Brown, and welcome to Better Tomorrow. My absolute favorite thing to do is have a heart-to-heart talk with my new friends and my best friends, where we sit down and talk about all the things like relationships and love, faith, and self-care. And of course, the little things as well, like the struggle to figure out what to eat tonight. All in all, I really want to ask, how am I better today than yesterday and bring artists, entrepreneurs, and friends along on the journey? So join me on the journey, will you? Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Better Tomorrow with Hannah Brown. I am, wow, feeling very thankful to be able to be with family this past week celebrating Thanksgiving. But man, I am like not feeling that great now. All that, you know, if you eat shit, you feel like shit. I'm just, I think that's just the way it works. And I, it's like every year I forget that. And then I just like gorge myself. And then I'm like, uh, I feel bad again. So hopefully y'all have learned from your past mistakes and don't feel shitty like I do. But if you do, I'm, I'm right there with you. But it was really fun while it lasted. It was great. I enjoyed it. I actually um, made multiple dishes for Thanksgiving. I made sweet potato casserole. I made this really great salad from actually Jesse James Decker's cookbook. It was delicious. It was like this Christmas wreath recipe. I think that's what it was called, but it was so good. Brussels sprouts, uh, this, my Aunt Faye's, it's like a cream cheese pie, but it's lemon flavored. And then it has like those pie filling, filling cherries on top. It was so good. And peanut butter balls. I mean, I really, I really went for it and everybody really liked my stuff, except I did, I did burn a sweet potato casserole <laughs> once. <laughs> The whole top of all the marshmallows, they were black. And I freaked out because I had been stressing over this dish like all day of like just trying to figure out timing of everything. Timing is really hard for me just in general. So when it comes to cooking and timing out all the different things that you have to cook, just it was a lot. But anyway, I burnt it (laughs) right before we were about to all eat. And I was just like, oh, no. And then they're like, it's okay, It's okay. Like, we'll just like scrape off the top and put more marshmallows on it. And I it was, I was distraught, but it ended up still tasting fine. But it was just so beautiful at first. Like I was watching it brown and I was like, oh, I think I'll just turn up the broil a little bit for the last two minutes. Well, in two minutes, it was, it was so black in two minutes. I don't know how that happened, but it did. We saved the day, ate all the things. It was great. Um, but now back to reality and, you know still in the holiday spirit and season and now just getting ready for Christmas. It's just a lot. It's a, it's a busy time of year, um, but also a really special time of year. But for this week's episode, we have probably the most requested person that you guys wanted me to have on this podcast. Um, it's another ex. Uh, <laughs> on the show, um, Tyler Cameron. Tyler just completed Special Forces this second season and was one of the last to complete the whole course, which was really exciting. And that's something that I also uh, had the opportunity to do for the first season. So I really wanted to talk to him about his experience on the show. And I'm just so excited that he was able to like have um, that unique perspective shift that just whole, just, I really think it's like a life changing experience to be able to do that show and that he learned a lot from that. And I was just really excited to talk to him about it because we have not chatted in a while for, I feel like I have got to get it, got to, got to, <laughs> I feel like I have to do a little backstory on this guest. I feel like most of you who followed me from my time on Bachelorette know Tyler probably very well in our dynamic, but there maybe are some of you that don't. So I feel like I should just kind of get into why I was a little apprehensive about having him on the show, to be honest. He was the most requested guest, 
And I want to make you guys happy for sure. But I also, um, he is somebody that I've had, (laughs) oh, what would I say? There's definitely history there. And I feel like we're both at such different places in our lives, but our history continues to come up. And I've tried to be really respectful of both of our lives moving forward and try not to really talk about him and press things, but it just seems like um, there just continues to be stories of a relationship-ish. I don't even call it a relationship, a situationship from four years ago between us. Um, and I'm just, I'm just past that. So going into having him on the podcast, I wanted to just be respectful for to my relationship, but also to where he is in his life and not really ask about, you know, or, or harp on our past just relationship and, and kind of how we're, we've been connected. And I think we'll forever be in some ways like a big part of each other's lives, but that's not really what this episode is really focused on. I would say our our relationship now is, is really unique because I do think there had to be some space for both of us to grow and kind of just carve out our own paths um, separately from the whole frenzy of us maybe, maybe not being together for a while, but we've been able to do that. And so it was great to be able to reconnect in a more professional way and just to really allow him to not have to talk about me and to talk about what he has going on in his life and what this newest experience that he shared with everyone being on special forces and going through that, like what that was like and what he has going on in his own life personally. Yeah, I I do think it's really unique that we are now at a place in our lives where we can support each other professionally. Um, And it's really cool to see just like how far we've come from, you know, being two, you know, young adults on a dating show and how we kind of got our start there and then have now gone on and done some really cool things. So uh, that is what this conversation is about. And like I said, we really haven't talked that much in a while, but I do Um, love that we were able to reconnect and we'll continue to support each other on things that are they're moving forward and uh, now have a more professional relationship where I feel like we can do that without being disrespectful for the growth and the ways that we've both moved on in our personal lives and uh, I think that that's really cool that now we can come back and do what we did in this conversation so yeah, I'm really excited and proud for Tyler for being able to, you know, complete this special forces uh, course. You know, I will say I I do personally think that doing it blind like I did and my course seemed a little bit harder, but I don't know. So I, I feel like I'm still top dog, but um, he did do very well and Uh, I think definitely learned a lot and grew a lot and pushed himself to his absolute limits. And it was really cool to see and to talk about. So with that, I hope you love this episode. And here's Tyler. Tyler Cameron is here. Hi, Tyler. What's up? So for y'all that don't know who Tyler is, Tyler was on season 15 of The Bachelorette when I was The Bachelorette. I guess we dated in some sort of way. And now is on season two of Special Forces. I want to talk about Special Forces because I was on the first season. Now you're you're on this season. And, you know, you called me 10 minutes before you're supposed to go in. You told me I could always call you and I could always depend on you to answer the phone. And you didn't. Well, I hadn't heard from you before or since. So I'd love to know how it went. You know, I called you because I, you know, I was like, you know what? I'm not gonna call her. And then I was like, last last minute, I was like, I'm gonna call her because I really want to know what the heck I'm about to get myself into. Because you did tell me it was like the hardest thing you've ever done before, but I was like, yeah, Hannah's hard is maybe a little different than my hard because you know I played college football. I had a crazy dad that put me through hell with training. Hannah, your hard is really hard. Your Hannah, you're, I mean, you're tough. Really freaking hard. Do you feel like? 
what was harder would you say special forces or bachelorette the, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you, both are mental warfare, trying to date you, trying to be, you know, in good grace with the DS mental warfare. Oh, it was, I, I agree. <laughs> but don't you feel, like, I agree on both of those. I think we're both scary in our own way. You could be the DS. I probably could be. I feel like I could tap into You'd be that. Good at it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe they'll need a, a woman DS. I don't know. I'm not anywhere is like we just got to do like a small amount of what they actually get to do it made my respect for people that are in the special forces go up like so much yeah um, but you struck you struck fear in all of us on the bachelorette in a certain way so you know yeah maybe we'll see call me special forces um but do you feel like the bachelorette in some way prepared you for it because I feel like my time on The Bachelor, Bachelorette did, but I'm interested to know what you think. Yeah, one of the real big similarities was on The Bachelorette, you would see somebody start to crumble in their own head and they would start like finding excuses or making excuses or just losing their mind, basically. And then on the Special Forces, same thing would happen. Like as soon as they could think of an excuse to get out, they would start to crumble. They start feeling sorry for themselves. They find this excuse that would validate them to leave. And that was kind of the same thing with like the bachelorette is they would find something to like validate why they should leave or, or, or validate a reason to talk to you. And like, and it would be so like out of left or right field. Like, like Connor Saley, for instance, remember on his season, like thought everything was good, bro. And then all of a sudden you started to like thinking too much into it. And then it started, then he, like, he confronted you, made things weird with you. It, it kind of crumbled from there. And then he left on his own will. Kind of the same thing happens in special forces. Like someone, you know, like they, they, you know, Brian Austin Green was on there, and he's like, "Man, I want to get home to my nice, you know, I got a nice life at home. What am I doing, you know?" And so I think like there was that was like one of the big similarities is like once something, you know, they once they got real uncomfortable, or something didn't go their way, you they find an excuse, and then they would just tear into them and crumble and crumble, and they'd be gone within like twelve hours. Yeah, that, that I definitely noticed that. Like if you started thinking about home or any of the like, just like the luxuries of life that you have, even if it's like just a nice bed and you start getting into that, that headspace of, of wanting and longing for that. I feel like that's when you, I knew like the next person, like when they were going to be out. I mean, obviously you knew you were going to do the show. You knew it would be difficult in some capacity, but when was the moment that you were like, oh shit, like this is actually legit. Yep, gotcha. Uh, so day five, they go and we do the boat carry, right? And then we, we we double off that day and do a, a fight. We have to run like a mile and a half to the fight, run back a mile and a half after the fight. The fight takes out a lot of energy. Next morning, day six, we wake up and they put us through a beasting. And that beasting was the most brutal beasting we've done i mean jumping through the frozen trough all the stuff they made us do during that workout was brutal like you see nick almost tap completely i mean he had we had to throw him in the the hot shower uh i mean I, I remember trying to warm up and my hands felt like knives were going through him because it was so cold and then like trying like the heat was just like causing so much pain so we did that and then later we did the leopard crawl which i got to the leopard crawl a lot I was like, I can check out. I'm good. Like, I'm just going to get through this mission and be done. Then, then since we all screwed up so much, they made us run up and down this hill until they got tired. And then, then they did this thing where we had to do a fireman carry to simulate like soldiers dying. And I had to carry, I had to carry my guy like a half mile, three quarters of a mile, you know, out. Once I got done with all that, I really sat down there and I was like, what am I doing to myself? I'm killing myself. You know, I already made my money off this show. Like, I'm good. I can go have a margarita on the beach somewhere. Like, I got, I, I put myself like 12 days of vacation after this. I can get to the beach now. And I started, I started getting into a deep hole then. And I was like, this, like, I'm, I'm hurting. I'm tired. I don't want to be here anymore. I started, I, started, I, I, I wrote it in my journal. I wrote my journal. Hand me be proud. Y'all got uh, to have journals? Yeah. Well, we had stuff that we had to like write and take notes with. Okay. Yeah. So we turned it into journals. Um, 
But I wrote, I remember I was like, every time I would try to think of a good shot, a bad or a good idea, a bad idea would come. And I kind of was like, you know, like taking a shot, I'd think of a good idea and I'd chase it with a bad idea always. I was like, I got to get this out of my head. What do you mean by that? Like, can you give me an example of what that means? Like what kind of. I'll be like, I'll be like I can get through this. But I'm like, but damn, you got three more days of this, you know? And then I'm like, if you don't finish this and Hannah finishes it, like you're a loser, you know? <laughs> Like you're soft. Okay, and then please like, tell me did that did I in some way help make sure that you completed it? You're in the back of my mind. And then I'd be like, you know, I'd be like, you know, if Hannah can do it, you can do it. And then I'd be like, but damn, it's only gonna get harder from here, you know? And so like every time I think of a good idea, my mind would give me a bad idea or a bad thought. And I that's why they like, compared to like taking a shot, you take a shot and then you take a chaser with it, you know, and and then eventually I started stretching. I started like helping out other people out, trying to be positive. And then, it, you know, I wrote it all out and it all went away. I feel like in that show, or I don't want to say show, in that course experience, it's always like, I remember we kind of had the similar type day. So when I was on the show um, last year, we were in Jordan, which was like 120 degrees, totally different type of atmosphere than what you guys were in, you were in New Zealand or something where it was like below freezing, um, which I know for you was probably really difficult being a Florida boy, but we had like that same, we had that same, like, like day four or five where, oh my gosh, like they just like physically broke mm -hmm. you down to where it was like, physically, I don't know if I can do anymore. I remember that moment of like, if it continues to stay like this, I was not an athlete. Like, I don't know if my body can continue to go, but I just kept, st I stayed. And then it went to like, more like, I feel like it went to like mental warfare the last few days. I don't know if that's true for how it was for you, but it was like, it, it takes you all the way to the, like the breaking point. And it's just like, if you can stay there, nothing lasts forever. Exactly. No, you, I mean, you make a really good point. Nothing, nothing does last, you know, like you, like every time you got through something, there was always something cool on the other side of it, you mm -hmm. know, or something that was like, man, I did it, you know, like some sort of gratification. Um, but I think towards the end, it was all mental warfare. Cause like you're at day seven, I'm going to drag my body through whatever. Cause I'm already here. Like I, when I, when I got to day six, it's like, you're already at day seven pretty much. So you might as well be at day eight in my head. I'm like, just making mm -hmm. reasons why I'm already there, you know? And I was like, I ain't gonna let. Only thing's gonna try and quit is my is my brain. You know, my body. I'm gonna drag through whatever, and uh, and that was just the biggest battle was battling my mind and just keep going. Like like you'll get to the top of this mountain. You know, we did the sleds and I was dying and we were and I was losing. I was losing so bad for our team. I screwed us up, screwed Aaron up, and and then you know I was like, God, I was like, why am I here anymore? And but I was like, I knew I was gonna finish it because I'm at day seven. I'm not, I'm not going to quit before day eight comes, you know? And, uh, but yeah, but I'll tell you the, one of the things, the, one of the big drivers of, of going is Aaron and Jojo, the women of the show. So damn strong. Right. And I'm over here complaining in my head on these runs, or these hikes to wherever we're going. And I look at Jojo or I look at Aaron stone face, just killers, just marching through, marching through, like not, not, I, I'm sure in their head, they're thinking the same thing, but I look at them and they got the same backpack I got on. I was like, if they're not complaining, I can't complain. And I think that was, you know, I, I kept calling them, the, uh, you know, Thomas the train, little engine that could. I was like, they, they just kept going and going and going. I was like, well, I got a choice. I got to keep going if they're going, you know. And so I think just seeing how strong they were, I was like, well, I can't, I can't, you know, what's out. If they're not even flinching, you know. Yeah, I think that experience, the camaraderie that happens is really special and unique to anything that I know I've, I've experienced. Um, I didn't know anybody going on to that show. I don't, I know you knew of some people like Nick, but obviously weren't like close, but it's cool how I, I remember having those similar times of like, okay, if, if this person is still going, then I, I can do it. Even though I was kind of definitely the weakest link on the outside, I guess, but it really helped of like, 
just looking at like your other man on your right or left and being like, okay, I guess we're just, we're going to do this together. And I think I, I'm very impressed by Jojo. I love that you became friends with her because I've been a fan of her forever because she's just so uniquely herself and has made like an amazing, successful business and brand, but also just like very positive. What did you expect? What did you expect from her, like initially going in, and then what surprised you the most about her? Yeah, with JoJo, you know, going in, I was like, man, I, I like, who is this girl going to be? Uh, you know, I see the bows, all the crazy colors she wears. All the, I'm like, this is going to be the biggest diva of them all, you know. And I, I tell you what, when she got to it, I mean, she was. She just, like, she impressed me so much along the way. She was always on on everyone about, like, their dress code. She was making sure we were all, like, wearing the same thing, doing the right things. Sometimes she'd be annoying and pissing me off with it, but she was always right, you know. And, and I think a lot of that's to do with her dance background, the discipline about always looking the same and doing the same. Um, but, you know, so positive. She was a leader. I mean, she's 20 years old telling 50-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 30-year-olds to, to get in line, do this, do that. And... And also being super supportive and just her composure and maturity at 20 years old is is something that I wish I would have had. I would have been a lot more successful football player, that's for damn sure. But uh, but just the way she carries herself, truly, truly incredible and remarkable. And, and that's why she has all the success today. That's why I think she's the only one from Dance Moms to do what she does. Mm-hmm. Okay. Obviously, so Nick Vial was – on I, I know most people know this but for those that don't Nick Vial was the bachelor is in bachelor nation he was also on the show with you what was y'all's relationship like before the show and what was it like like what happened with your relationship you know being able to do this experience together yeah we really didn't have much of a relationship prior to the show you know, I did his podcast once. Um, I remember he said some things about us during quarantine and I was like, screw Nick. Yeah. And uh, but and then I got to go on the show with Nick. And what I love about the show is it strips everybody to just the raw realness of who they are. Um, and Nick, I got to see that. And uh, I just became, you know, boys with Nick ever since I can trust rely when you go through something like that and you can trust and lean and rely and depend on and knowing he's giving you the same kind of effort that you know you're giving and then like to see Nick go through his highs and lows and to fight through them and then come back on a high like that stuff right there I, I just gained so much respect for because I just know deep down like he'll do whatever it takes and like I know like like now I can like like my experiences I see with him doing that I'm like he's gonna be a great father great husband all these things, because I know at the end of the day, he'll do what it takes to make things happen. Yeah. Did you not, did you know before like you got into the course that he was going to be there? Or did you like show up and you're like, what the heck? No, I, I had an idea that he was going to be on there. Um, and I was okay. like, oh, this would be interesting, you know? And, and I thought he was going to start drama, you know, cause he can, he's good for making like little side remarks and things yeah. to kind of stir things up. But he was, <laughs> just so tired and spent he had he had no energy to you know do any of that but you know I, I, we were joking with natalie the other day uh his fi- his fiance soon to be wife and and uh we were talking about how she's like nick when you go on this show you're going to be quiet you're going to keep your head down you're going to be you know and he, that's i mean that's what he did he was just like so helpful to everybody he was there for everybody you know uh he was a huge part of everyone's success so did you watch my the season one of Special Forces? Yeah. Okay. Um, why is is there a reason why y'all's um, course was only two day or was like two days less than ours? Because the cold is so much more brutal than the heat. That's what they told you. That's what, that what I you mean. Think? That's just scientifically, <laughs> factually proven. Okay. I will say the first few episodes, I feel like they went easy on y'all, but maybe I can also say maybe they didn't show everything. It does look like it's getting more intense, but would you say like the first day or two you were like, okay, is something is about to get more difficult or was it immediately like, oh shit, this is bad. First first few days were more for me 
uncomfortable and fear driven than they were like physically tough. Mm -hmm. And I think I so I think they kind of put that stuff early on. So a lot of contestants can try things and they can they can film each person. Um, but the physical parts of it start is what trims the fat of the group and starts cutting people off. And so I think that's why that kind of goes into that as the show goes. Um, they make it harder and harder physically, but I think all that fear stuff they put up front to get everyone's reactions and all that, like the trinasium over like 300 feet in the air, I was losing my mind. And that was day one. And I like, I was more scared of falling than I was passing. And that's why I think I only, only reason why I passed. That was the one where you had to walk across with, um, yeah, we the had rails. to do that. But that was on like our day seven or eight. So mm -hmm. I, I hated that. That, um, what is that called? What what are they called? The task. I hated that task. It was yeah, horrible. That, that y'all just start off with that. I was like, okay, I kind of hate that one. I almost pulled my back because I was so tight. I like was flexing every single muscle because I didn't want to move anything wrong. And it was like a fifteen minute workout to get across. A, you know, I, it took me like ten minutes. I was going so slow and like so stiff. But yeah, it was it, that was you know I'm, I'm, my biggest fear is heights. So I was like, mm -hmm. that's well, number one, you know, so yeah, but, hey, we got through it. Who from the directing staff were you most intimidated by? Um, definitely Q, uh, DSQ, because he had this laugh and that laugh, like would hit at the right time. He was always in charge of our punishments. He was definitely like the most intimidating, scariest one. And also the one I wanted to like prove myself to the most. Like I wanted like to show me I got that dog in me, you know, because he, I mean, he's a seal. He went through hell. He did all that stuff, and uh, he was always coming after us and coming after me. So I was like, I always wanted to earn his respect. But he was definitely like the most intimidating one out of all of them. Yeah, I we did not um, on season one have DSQ, but he definitely seems like he was tough. Yeah, he's great for what he does. Now, who, did anyone give you nicknames? Oh my gosh. I can't remember what they called me. They just made fun of, they just made fun of me the whole time. Cause I would smile when I wasn't supposed to. Um, but no, they just called me four. Who, who, who intimidated you? It was weird because like Billy just screamed all the time and I didn't like that. And he just would constantly scream, but he was my favorite, but definitely like scared me the most. Because he had it, he was pretty intense with some like of the people on our show. Um, I think he just would like push buttons a lot to see what you would take and if you would be disrespectful. And not that I had any problem with like being disrespectful, but just he definitely wanted to try to get people to their point of breaking. So I think I was just more aware of him. Um, so yeah, that was probably who I was most intimidated by. I, guess I can definitely agree with that with Billy. Like he was definitely, he would definitely rip you the most, you yes. know, like, and he don't, give, he don't have any sympathy. He wants you to just listen, take it and, and just fall back in line. You know? Yeah. Like I'm throwing, I'm throwing up. And he's like, I'm swallowing you. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, you know? Okay. Like he just, I'm like right here throwing up chunks. Stand up so we can see you throw. Up. I'm like, all right, Bill. You know, like he's like no remorse, no nothing. But you know, you get you get his respect by just listening, shutting your mouth, and falling back in line. You know, I think football helped me with taking this yet these yellings and these beatings from these guys mm -hmm. because you know football. I got you know your coach would cuss you out, and even if he was wrong and you were to talk back to him, it would just make it worse. So I always learned, like, if, you know, they're, you're cussing you out, just eat it no matter what. And there may be a time down the road to talk about it, you know, in the right way. But they never want to be talked about in front of anyone else, too, because they never want to be embarrassed. They never want to lose power or dominance. So it was always, like, something that was, for like, really easy for me to do is, like, take take it, you know, get yelled at, you know. That was easy. I mean, even when Billy kind of yelled at me in the beginning, I was, like, smirking. I was, like, oh, shit, it's about to happen, you know, like, you um, know. Yeah, that, that was never – some people had trouble with that, but not, that was easy. Yeah. What do you feel like you learned about yourself during the course? 
Um, I think I learned that um, I haven't dealt with all my trauma and past issues correctly. Um, they still linger and they still hurt, and um, that like I still needed to do things for them. Um, what I love about the staff is they're so emotionally intelligent because of what they have to face day in and day out and all their near death experiences and people dying alongside of them that they have to unpack these situations all the time. And I think us here, you know, especially men, when something bad happens to us, we don't unpack it with really anybody. And um, I found that there's a lot of issues with my mom and just other things in my life personally that, you know, relationships with my brothers and all that stuff, my pops that, you know, as I wrote them out or as I discussed them more with them, I got more and more upset and more and more emotional, um, you know, doing the death letters and writing to my brothers and talking about my mom. Like, you know, I never, I haven't cried that hard in a long time. Yeah. Can you explain why that happens in that experience? Because, you know, it's obviously you're in, you're, you're doing all these physical tasks, but it's also like this mental component. Like, why do you feel like all that was brought up? I think when you're so tired and worn out and beat up, it's so easy to get emotional, you know? And I think that's, you know, and they make you talk through these things. They make you, you know, they're, they're not bringing you in the interrogation room just to, Hey, how you doing? They're bringing you in this interrogation room to see who you are, what you've gone through and how you dealt with it. You know, and certain things I've dealt with fine, something, a lot of things I haven't dealt with, you know, and I think uh, when you're extremely tired and, you know, it's easy to get emotional. And then when you really have time to reflect, like you do in there, like you're, when you're writing these death letters or you're sitting there, you don't have your phones, you don't have distractions like Instagram or social media or, or people calling you all the time. You have to do a lot of reflection and you have to sit down and think about the things I've missed or the things that aren't here anymore um, the people that are gone, you know, and the relationships with your brothers and your dad and, you know, good or bad, you know, you really get to reflect and relive those, you know, in that show. And it makes for one great TV, but two really good therapy for yourself and for, you know, just the stories I write. And also you hear other people's stories and you realize some of my problems are real problems, but some of my problems are also really small problems. And I, you know, I don't, I can move on. I can push past it, you know, when I hear what some people have gone through. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, just being tired and then having the time to reflect without distractions is like a reason why all that happens. Yeah. What um, has changed in your life or what did the experience prompt to change in your life after you got back home? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of the time I was over there, I was reflecting about, okay, what are you going to do when you get home? What, what, how, how is this going to make your life better? You know, are you happy with the life you're living before? I was like, I was trying to make this a real pivot for me in my life. And, um, you know, I, I was going through a really hard time leading up to this show, like with the project I was working on, um, things, some things went well on it. Some things went really, really wrong, bad on it. And, you know, comments was a little shook um not just not happy with where i was in life and you know had to let go of some people and just you know taking my lumps but i was like you can either keep folding and keep feeling sorry for yourself or you can get through this show you can get through anything and you can get through whatever's going on back home and uh it just kind of lit a new fire under my ass and i was excited to get home excited to work excited to grind um it, it i mean it got me back into discipline it got me getting up early training and it got me trying to make every hour count, um, with work and all that. Um, but it also kind of was like, all right, enough of the BS too, about like messing around, going out, dating random, you know, it's like all that. So it was like, let's try and lock in and try and find something real and important because, you know, the DS, they all, they all have something that's special and important to them, you know, back at home. And it's meaningful. I was like, damn, I want that. You know, and I was just started reflecting on who that could be or what that could be. And um, and ever since I've been home, I've been really focusing on that as well. I kind of want to go back to now that you're back in Florida, you just bought a home. How has that been going, renovating? What is it like being, because this is your first home that you bought for yourself, correct? 
Yeah, it's my first home for myself. I love the neighborhood. I love where I'm at. It's such a fun neighborhood. Like Halloween was popping yesterday. Mm-hmm. Or Halloween was popping. Uh, like we had haunted houses in the street, kids running around. Like this is a cool neighborhood. You know, there's always parties going on throughout the neighborhood. This neighborhood loves to drink. Um, it's a good time. Uh, but the house in itself is like a beautiful old 1970s home. I'm so excited to go through it and renovate it. I was going to do it room by room. So I started with the garage, made it to a sick gym. Now, now I'm doing the, uh, the patio, but patio ran to a huge hiccup that took me a lot more, like two weeks to try, not two weeks, but a week and a half to fix. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do the whole house at once now. This way, if there's a hiccup somewhere, I can go somewhere else to do something. And uh, so now I'm going to rip the Band-Aid. I got a pod coming in tomorrow. And we are going to rip this house apart and get this thing going. Oh my gosh. Now are you're not doing, are you doing this fully yourself? Do you have people coming in to actually let know what they're doing? I'm just kidding. A lot of it's going to be myself and uh, some immediate team members I have that work for me. Um, but for like the finer finishes, um, you know, like drywall and all that stuff, I want the good guys to come in because one day it'll be a, a property I'll sell probably. Um, so I wanted to have really nice finishes and all that because I'm good for some things, you know, but not good for a lot. So <laughs> what's it been like being back in the home construction, kind of being in the family business with your dad? Um, what have you enjoyed about that? And then what has been more difficult than you thought it was going to be? It's been great being home. You know, I, I, I'm, I feel like when I was living in New York, I had nothing to do. You know, I would just wait for the next job or dinner or gig or whatever it was. And it just led to drinking and partying and a whole lot of nothing where here, you know, I have four restaurants now. I have two Airbnbs. I got, you know, a construction company. I got a house for sale right now, a lot for sale. Like I'm making moves and doing things here. I'm like, I have a day to day now, you know, and I love having a day to day. I love what I'm doing and it's exciting. It's fun. Um, I got to get better at doing the social media part with it. So I can kind of bring more people along the ride, what's going on. Um, but that's kind of, kind of like a goal. But yeah, I, I love it. I love being home. I love to do some things with my pops. We argue a ton, though. You know, it's hard. Like We did a house together that we're selling, and he did the primary bathroom himself. And boy, I hope a geologist comes and buys our house because we got about three different stones in there. And I'm like, <laughs> pops, man, you really did something here. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, well, I saw the designers you worked with before, what they did. And I was like, yeah, but but they're designers and and you're just, you know, you're, you're a builder, an old builder too. Yeah. But hey, we're going to yeah. get a soul. Um, like you just kind of listed off all the things that you're doing. You have a lot of your hand in a lot of different things right now. How are you managing it all? Like what and what are you trying to focus on the most right now? Um. Managing it all, I think, you know, when it comes to certain things, you got to have the right people. Um, and, you know, if you have, like, I, I don't believe, like, having partners is tough. It's really hard. But you just have to know your roles and how to play your role as a partner. Like, my restaurants, I am not an operating partner. I am a marketing, you know, partner and, and a money partner. And when it comes to day-to-day, I stay out of it. You know, just whatever you need, call me. I'll help you figure it out. And we've been very successful doing that. Um, when it comes to... Construction, me and my pops butt head, so we kind of just do our own projects, you know. Um, but I, I think what I'm most excited for is really leaning into construction, leaning into my house and showcasing it for everyone to see and seeing what we can really come up with here and then kind of roll up from there. I got like a big meeting. I got a big meeting in Jacksonville this weekend, and that's hopefully to, to go buy more properties and more projects for you know us to do. So it's just kind of how to keep this ball rolling and, and keep growing. I will say, I feel like when you decide you want to do something, you, you make it happen. And I really admire that. Cause I feel like I can let fear stop me from some of the things that I say I want to do. But, um, I don't know if I have the capacity to handle as much as you've got going on. So props to you. You kind of hit on this earlier about during special forces, kind of what you learned that, you know, you lost your mom unexpectedly in February, 2020. And you've had, that was really hard and have had to learn how to process that. But something I really 
admire about you and your brothers is that y'all started a foundation for your mom, the Andrea C. Cameron Foundation. And I was kind of there during that time. And I remember it was like right after everything happened. And you guys started on this immediately because it was important for y'all to take this like really horrible situation and find the good in it. And now I just saw that you had your second annual gala. What has that foundation meant to you and your brothers? Yeah, this, I mean, th this, honestly, the foundation is probably like my, it's my, it's my baby. It's my pride and joy. Um, you know, I've always, I always told everybody if I could do anything, I, I want to be a coach, help kids go to college. And right now I don't have time to, to be a coach. Uh, one day, hopefully, but right now I can help kids go to college. Um, so we started this foundation and, uh, you, you know, to find light in a really dark, dark situation. Um, and it's been amazing. You know, we just had our second gal. We raised $500,000. Um, we're going to, uh, we, our goal was to get enough money to get 10 full tuition scholarships to uh, kids in Florida. Now we're probably going to do way more because of how much we raised and we have a lot of other cool ideas and projects, you know, we're going to do a big Thanksgiving give back and hang out, hand out a bunch of turkeys and food. Um, we're going to do something for Christmas for all the families around us, just allowing us to touch a lot of families, impact a lot of families, get kids on full tuition, take that financial burden off of them uh, and off their parents. Um, it's amazing, you know, and this is what my mom would do. My mom would be having a huge impact on this community one way or the other, what she always did. She was a team mom. She was the rock to so many friends, so many people. Um, she always was helping my teammates and friends. When I was at college, I'd call home and they'd be at my mom's house getting dinner and getting ACT tutoring. I'm like, what do you get out of my house? You know, they're like, no, your mom's helping me out, you know, but like, that's who she was. And so like, we're trying to honor her and honor that by doing what we do now. And it's, it's incredible. Like we have right now we have seven girls uh under under scholarship right now and we surprised three of them with full you know covering their full tuition which we weren't able to before but now we are uh you know just to do that just to give back to be there for our kids um is amazing and we, we mentor them we help them get internships jobs all that so no it really is amazing and i think it's so cool that i remember thinking like wow this is really soon when you you started it but like so proud of you you guys and what you're doing it's it's really incredible mm -hmm. um well my mom would yell at us we didn't get out of bed on time and, and there's always a sense of urgency with her so mm -hmm. i was we have, to, we have to keep that sense of urgency rolling that's right that's right you have had a crazy past few years um and you've been through a lot without having i would say like your mom was your rock um what have you learned about grief because i feel like Grief is something that many people who haven't gone through something as tragic, like a tragic loss, don't understand. So, like, what have you learned about the grieving process? Yeah, grief comes in waves. Um, it hits you out of nowhere. Um, take your time with it and don't ever feel guilty for how long of time you have to take. Um, I think I didn't sit in grief enough or long enough. And I think that's a thing I do, whether it's relationships, whether it's losing somebody, I try to put a smile on my face, get back in front of people and get back to work because I just like, that's how I've dealt with it. And, um, you know, I think that's the wrong way to deal with things. I think you really need to sit through things, feel things, get, you know, get through things. But like I said, it's in waves, you'll be six months down the road and something will hit you or remind you of it and you'll feel it again. And. You know, I think I'm at the point now in life where it's just like, damn, I wish you could see this. or Damn, I wish you were a part of this. Or, you know, you're supposed to be right here with me doing this. You know, um, I think that part of it is like where I'm at right now in life. Um, but also like, you know, I can, you know, I feel like, you know, there's still some healing and stuff like grief is it's four years later and I'm still dealing with it, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, you'll always miss your mother. You know, you always need your mom. Yeah. I, I'm also interested what you, what you think about, cause I think, I think it's also important who you surround yourself with during being in that grieving process. And sometimes it's hard for the people around somebody who's going through grief to know what to do. 
I can even say for myself. Oh, you learned that firsthand. Yeah. I was going to say, I don't know if I really knew how to um, support or tried to support and maybe didn't do it in the, in the best way. Mm -hmm. So what advice do you have for people who are trying to like love and care for somebody that's going through a really hard time? Like what advice do you have for, for those people? I think just be there, be available and be around. Um, and even send texts or do things that just be, Hey, thinking about you, hope you're having a great day. You know what I mean? Or, Hey, I was here for you if you need to talk, you know? Um, I think when you're struggling with grief, you, you don't want to go to somebody sometimes or you don't want to talk because you don't want to be a burden sometimes as, as part of, you know, the issues I've dealt with was like, I don't want to talk about this because I don't want this to be about me. I don't want this to be a burden to somebody, you know, there's more to talk about in life, you know, like I can handle this. And I think, um, always being there and eventually they're going to talk to you about it. Eventually they're going to go through it. You know, it's just being available, being ready for when it is and don't be pushy, you know? Yeah. But cause it's, it's going to happen. They're going to talk about it. They're going to open up. It just, some people can do it right away. Some people it takes time and, and it, it takes, it takes me a long time. So last question, I feel like, even just from talking, we haven't really talked in, in a bit, but it seems like you've really learned a lot about yourself and have had these unique experiences in the past, you know, year, past months. How do you think that you're showing up better today than you were yesterday? There's a saying that discipline will carry you and motivation won't. And I think to be better today and to be better tomorrow, um, carry out the little tasks, the little discipline you know, the, the points in your life that you need to be disciplined with, carry those out consistently because you're not going to always feel up for it. You're not going to always want to do it. Create these habits, create these, you know, points in life that, okay, I need to get up. I need to make my bed. I need to go do this. I need to go do that. I need to, you know, I need to go work out. I need to go walk in this morning, you know, like, and then, then you're going to start to realize like you rely on those things. And that's that discipline you're creating. And sometimes when you're feeling down, you'll still carry out these tasks and your discipline will carry you and your motivation won't. And I think that's kind of how I'm trying to build up a bunch of good habits, a bunch of, you know, you know, get my discipline correct. And so when I'm feeling down and not feeling up for things, I just kind of almost like a robot. You just go and you get it done, you know? And now I, I, I definitely agree. How are you going to be better today than you were yesterday? Uh, I think how I'm better today than yesterday is taking a little bit more time to evaluate how I'm feeling. I think for like the past few months, I've been kind of disconnected from myself. And so I'm really trying to, even though I don't feel like it kind of goes back to your point. Like I don't feel as connected to my emotions and my just creativity to like, just try to sit down and start. And it might be some shit ideas and I might can only like get through a little bit of how I'm feeling. But if I continue to do that, um, I'm going to get somewhere. So kind of the same thing as you, I'll have to take some of your confidence and just, uh, bring the beast back. Go, go get, go get them spirit. I know I'm working on it. I really bring the beast back. All right. It's always a pleasure, Tyler. So glad we got to catch up. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for listening to the episode. Better Tomorrow is produced by me, Hannah Brown, and Legos Creative. Our producer is Andrew Stalmer. Our show is recorded, engineered, and edited by the Legos Creative team. Remember to follow Better Tomorrow wherever you get your podcast so you don't miss the next episode. And don't forget to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It really helps and shows your support. You can follow me on socials at Hannah Brown and you can stay updated on all things Better Tomorrow on our Instagram at Better Tomorrow and our TikTok Better Tomorrow podcast. Mm-hmm.